this provision about the use of TARP resources is about Treasury's use of TARP resources. The law does not direct us to impose internal controls over the 500 banks that we've invested in, just to be precise. Okay, thank you. Uh, we're gonna, I'll, I'll come back to that thank in the next round of questioning. Uh, we're going to go to Mr. Uh, Jordan. Thank Mr. You, Jordan, you're recognized yeah, for five and, and minutes. Mr. Kashkari, I want to go back to where I was about an hour and a half ago with, with this, this whole concept. And again, I was one of the individuals who did not vote for the, the, uh, the TARP program back uh, last fall. But here's what I'm trying to understand. You, you know, you're a sharp guy. Um, Tim Geithner's a sharp guy. Hank Paulson's a sharp guy. Ben Bernanke is a smart guy. How was it that um, back in October, October 3rd, that all of you were convinced and, and the package was uh, sold to the Congress that you were going to be able to, what, what did you think then that was going to allow you to go after the toxic assets, the troubled assets, that since then you haven't been able to do? I mean, it, it was this assurance that members got, the public got, the taxpayers got, that you could in fact clear the bad stuff out and things would get moving back towards normal, and yet now five months later, still not there. So, tell me what you what you thought you knew, but yet found out you didn't really know. Walk me through that again, if you can. Uh, thank you. I'm happy to. When we went to the Congress, you're right. We talked about, and the plan was to purchase mortgage-related assets in large volumes to get those markets moving again. Uh, the crisis intensified so much. Just in, the few, in just in the two weeks we were negotiating with Congress and the one or two weeks that followed, that we had to move even faster. Dollar for dollar, putting a dollar of capital in goes much further, as you, I'm sure, understand with leverage, than just buying a dollar of assets. So we had to take the most aggressive action we could to stabilize the system. So that's why we ended up leading with capital. Mm -hmm. Now, for an asset purchase program to work, it must be done in very, very large scale. Once we concluded in the fall, that we had to allocate almost half of the money for a capital program, and we had these one-off contingencies that we had to deal with. We were left with fewer resources, and the question was, would, if we only spent half the money on asset purchases, would it be big enough in light of the $14 trillion residential and commercial mortgage market? What Secretary Geithner has done is saying, look, let's take the available resources, let's combine it with the private sector and leverage it up so we can increase our purchasing power and go make a big dent on a very big market. And so it's just, it's about speed of implementation, mm -hmm. it's about impact, and it's about scale with which to go at the problem. Let me ask you another question. Uh, and and uh, talking with some folks, reading about this, this phenomenon, uh, would you uh, agree that the mark-to-market -market concept is, is good in, in, the, in, the, in the framework of disclosure, but not so good in, 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 a, uh, in the context of, of, in the regulatory context? Is, is, and it, and if so, are there some reforms we can do that kind of fit that statement that are going to help us as we move forward? I think the mark-to-market -market issue has a lot of benefits, and I think it is good in terms of disclosure for investors. But keep in mind, right now we have an environment where investors are questioning the value and the meaning of regulatory capital standards. Mm -hmm. And so if we said, well, there's going to be one set of standards for the books that the investors get to see, but don't worry, there's, a, there's a, a different set of standards for regulators to use. That may not support more confidence for investors as they look at the institutions. I think mark-to-market -market is a very important issue. I know the SEC has recently done a study on it, and I think we need to look at it as we go you about regulatory reform. You personally, reform. What, what, what do you think, if any, changes can be made to that, to the mark-to-market -market, um, rule that can be positive? Uh, well, let me go back. Do you, do you agree that there's, there's some potential with what I just described, mark-to-market -market in a disclosure sense, but uh, some, some amending in the, in the regulatory context? I think that that is something that's worth looking at. I'll tell you, I'm probably not the best. There are better experts than me on the accounting treatment of mark-to-market -market versus accrual accounting, for example, and in the regulatory context. I think that these are things we should look at, but I, especially in the middle of the crisis that we're in. Mm -hmm. I think we should be cautious about making changes that seem like a good idea at the time. I think we need to get through this crisis, we need to have a thoughtful discussion, analyze these issues, and then make the long-term changes that we need to make. Okay. Thank you, Chairman. I, I thank the gentleman. Uh, Chair, recognize Mr. Tierney. Thank you. Thanks for coming back, Mr. Kishkari. We appreciate it. Um, 
Earlier we talked about the fact that uh, you're going to have these partnerships that are going to be partly with taxpayer money and partly with other investors going out and getting the bad assets. And I mentioned that some of them might be hedge fund people that taxpayers might think we're getting benefited after already doing things that cause part of the problem. And you said that you thought instead that most of the money would come from pensions or other investors. So given the fiduciary responsibilities of uh, people that run these pension funds and given the stressed nature of these troubled assets, what is the sales pitch that you're going to make to them to think that they can invest in them and still meet their fiduciary responsibility? Because now I know there are a lot of people that have an interest in those pensions going to be sitting out there going, oh, my God, that's what, where our money's going to go? Um, well, thanks for providing me the opportunity to follow up. <clears throat> if you look at pension plans, big pension plans, and retirement programs for teachers or, or government workers or employees, they allocate different parts of that money to different classes of investments. They'll allocate some to government securities, some to equities, some to alternative asset classes such as private equity or even hedge funds. And those are typically much smaller asset classes, much smaller segments. So it would not surprise me to see major pension funds saying, okay, we're going to put a small slice of this towards real estate assets or mortgage-related assets because we think the, tr the prices over the long term are, are attractive. And so I don't want to give anybody the impression that huge pockets of people's pension plans are going to be put at this. But I think if you look at the amount of savings we have as a country, retirement savings, small slices can add up to big dollars. Okay. So you're basically saying to them that it's, it'll be a good investment for that small slice to go in and buy these toxic assets. So you, with your other investments, one little slice of it ought to go toward really troubled assets. I think that that's a, that's a reasonable position that portfolio managers are going to be looking at and, and analyzing as they make their decisions. Okay. Um, all right. I would think that you might get some of the hedge funds to do it, but I think people, unless they can see a bigger upside on, on that, it's going to be a stretch for them to do that. Uh, can you, just following up on another question that was asked earlier about AIG, and Mr. Welch had asked about uh, can't we favor uh, those in, uh, people that AIG is dealing with as co-partners or whatever over a uh, certain other group that uh, maybe ought not to be favored as much. And you said, well, if we do that, if we discriminate with one set of people against another, then the remaining people can bring the company into bankruptcy. You explain to us how it is that they're able to do that, or they'll do that. And secondly, what would be the consequences of AIG's bankruptcy? Uh, thank you. If I have a contract with a financial institution and that financial institution just des decides not to honor my contract, I have recourse. I can sue them uh, as a creditor. Uh, I don't know the different legal requirements. Uh, a group of creditors could come together and say, okay, you haven't honored your obligation to me. You may have paid off your policyholders, but you haven't honored your commitments to me. I'm going to go to the courts to try to get my money, and which may end up pushing the company in bankruptcy, uh, et cetera. So again, this is something that, as I indicated earlier, nobody wanted to do. But the unfortunate consequence of bailing out an institution is you help everybody in the institution, you really don't get to pick or choose. Now, if we had allowed AIG to go into bankruptcy, uh, not only would potentially, AIG has 30 million policyholders in the US, 30 million. Not only could those policyholders be put at risk, but all of the businesses that AIG provides insurance for, all of their business customers around the world, I think they operate in more than 100, com in 100 countries, could all be uh, exposed to some type of financial risk. Uh, there could be various collateral calls from other institutions. And so the, the judgment was not, we like AIG or we want to help AIG. It was the system as a whole could be put at risk if this were allowed to go into bankruptcy, especially at a time when the financial markets are still uh, in a state of low confidence. And your, your feeling is that all 30 million of those people would lose their policies, that the businesses would all go under, that this whole thing would be such a tragedy you couldn't, you couldn't risk it, or that you just have an uncertainty that nobody wants to risk? I think that there's a large uncertainty, and the downside, the risks of the downside are much larger than even the large dollars that we're having to spend to support the institution. I don't want to suggest that everybody's policies would be gone. I think that's an overstatement. Mm -hmm. But I think that there'd be a lot of risk for everybody uh, that is a customer or a counterparty or a partner of AIG in any, in any respect. Thank you. Neil back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I thank the gentleman. Uh, Mr. Souter, you may proceed for five minutes. I wanted to follow up again on some credit questions uh, that uh, I have 58% uh, of the RV market in the country in my district. I have the Silverado and Sierra uh, biggest GM pickup plant. Uh, 
and I need the credit opened up. And I wanted to illustrate a, a couple of different things. Uh, uh, Congressman uh, Donnelly DeFazio and I had a, uh, an amendment uh, to the car, truck, motorcycle that included RVs on retail floor plan financing. Uh, because part of the problem in retail floor plan financing, and let me deal with the RV, the auto has a similar, is, is that there were basically three major companies that did it, Textron, GE Capital. They pulled out. You can't sell anything if you can't get it to a dealer. That, uh, that these are fairly large purchases, particularly for, for motorhomes, and nobody would take the market. So we tried to get a tranche set. It, it, it was, didn't pass the Senate, it was a House advisory. Uh, and that the similar, one of the problems here is, is that in American manufacturing, because of legacy costs, because of health and pension and our wage rate, we make bigger vehicles. The smaller stuff tends not to be American made. So they require bigger and longer term investments. Let me give you one illustration. In one lot in a major city in the south, they tried to ha clear their lot of some of the uh, RVs and motorhomes. That the, uh, they sold eight, which was not a good sale day. Uh, of those eight, two were in the 350 to 500,000 range. Uh, four were in the uh, 100 to 250 range, and two were used towables under 25,000. All had credit scores, the buyers, of over 700. Only one was actually financed, and it was a $15,000 used towable. The reason is, is that they, nobody wants to take a 15-year, $500,000 mortgage right now, uh, partly going back to the mark-to-market -market question, which I need to point out, assumes that you're going to liquidate the premise underneath it. So the combination of the retail floor financing and the lack of for bigger purchases is hammering the car, auto, truck, RV markets. And unless we can figure out how to get some liquidity into that system, Fleetwood declared bankruptcy this morning. Uh, they're going all over the place. It's spilling into manufactured housing. Uh, and, and we try to address a little of the housing in, in the, with housing credits. But this is a, a huge double problem, compounded by, and one other thing I wanted to, to raise to you as you look at how to handle this, that there are buybacks, which the auto companies are starting to get into, but the RV industry, that aren't on their books. They've never had a problem before because when one dealer can't sell it, they move it to another dealer. But if they can't get retail floor planning, all of a sudden this stuff is coming back, out they go. Uh, thousands of people being laid off when, in fact, there appears to be some market. How do we open that credit market up if they don't know in the lending institutions what their assets are? That's why we keep bringing up a variation of mark to market. Uh, Congressman, thank you. This is a huge issue. It is a huge issue that we are, we have teams of people working on. And this goes back to the new facility under the Consumer and Business Lending Initiative. It's called the TALF program that the Federal Reserve has set up. It's going to start funding in a couple weeks. It's, it's ready now. It's finally launched. That's going to specifically bring down costs of borrowing for auto loans, for credit cards, for student loans, for small business loans. Right now, as a starting point, it's a $200 billion facility. We have a plan to increase it to a trillion dollar facility and to add other asset classes. So we are looking at all different sorts of asset classes to see what else we can put in there to get liquidity to the markets so that people can buy motorhomes and RVs and cars and trucks, et cetera, uh, until we get through this crisis. So I assure you, Congressman, we are focused on this too. We get the same calls you get, not as many as you get because it's your district, but we get the same calls you get. We know it's a real problem, and we think we're on the right track to bring down these borrowing costs. Because who can go afford today and buy a car and pay a 14 or 15 percent loan? No one's going to do it. We need to bring these rates down so that our businesses can continue to do business. And there, and there needs to be some kind of addressing of this uh, size, volume of, of loan and length of loan question. Uh, some of the RV people had talked to me initially about could they pool but with a, a, a fee such that to help share if some went bad. Uh, there's got to be some kind of risk sharing on the longer term and sizable loans or that market will not free up. And, and those tend to be our American manufacturers because we're skewed to the higher value ends. And uh, those big areas, construction and auto truck, I believe are close to 50 percent of much of our uh, American uh, hmm. economy, that retail sales, if you, if you take uh, 
a manufacturing job or a value added, which could be software or whatever, is going to circulate different at a different rate in a productivity and multiplier effect than a service job or a labor intensive job. And that sector is overwhelmingly tied to construction and auto. It yeah. intends to go boom bust. But the way the, the financial markets have collapsed so deeply, it's not clear how we get it restarted, especially if the uh, debt that the government's taking on starts to crowd out private borrowing and private equity. They're going to be, and mark to markets chewing them up, which was a change. Uh, it's not a, when you say it's a problem changing back, it was a change to it that partly triggered this, uh, that, that uh, it, it's not clear how we reopen the credit market because well, capital is going to be so tight. Well, Congressman, we think the new facility that the Fed has set up is going to help restart not just the market and get rates down, but bring private capital back. Because the way it's designed, it's designed that the private sector puts in capital, the government lends to it, gets the markets going again. And then our hope is, as the credit markets heal themselves, that the private sector will be able to go back and then the government can step back, can step away. So we're focused on this. The only other thing I would add, don't forget, the administration has an auto task force, a whole team of people focused just on the autos to try to get them to a place of long-term viability. And so there's a team working there, Treasury, it's an interagency program looking at autos, looking at auto suppliers, looking at some of their financing constraints as well. So we're coming at it from both directions. I think the gentleman uh, chair recognizes Mr. Cummings. Mr. Kashkari, um, the um, you know there are, there are a lot of banks that that are returning their money. Is that right? They want to return the money. Yes. And they apparently want to return this TARP money because of restrictions and the things that you talked about a little bit earlier that the Obama administration is. Um, demanding, and the public is demanding. Um, how do you feel about that? I'm just curious. I mean, in, in just in a few words, because I got some other things I want to ask sure. you. Uh, I'm I'm concerned because in many cases the banks that want to return the money, or in, we've got 200 banks that we've approved that have said no thank you, and in most cases the ones that are saying no thank you or who've expressed an interest to return are the strongest healthiest of our institutions. Those are the very ones we want to take more capital because they're in the best position to extend credit. And so I, I understand, well, in any case. Well, now, now that leads me to something else then. Um, so they're the stronger, the stronger banks. They want to give the money back because they don't want to go uh, abide by the Obama and rules, President Obama's rules. And it seems like then they, they should be in a better position, particularly if they had the money, to make the loans. And so it sounds like they, are more, they might be more interested in continuing to operate as usual, as opposed to seeing our economy come out of this great slump that we're in. I'm just curious. It's a, it's a tough it's a tough problem to answer with precision because, yeah. as I indicated earlier, 60% of our credit is from banks, 40% is non-banks. I know the 40% is not working right now. We're trying to get that going. If you look at the lending survey that we did do, which covers the majority of the banks in the country in terms of dollars, lending has held up remarkably well. A lot of banks, especially the smaller banks, will say they're just scared because they're hearing so much noise out of Washington. They're saying, do I really need the, the headache? of taking this additional money. I know if I took additional money, I could put it to work, but there's so much coming out of Washington right now. They're calling us and saying, you know what? No, thank you. I just, I don't know, what, I don't know what's coming, and so no thank you. And so we're disappointed by that because we want the strongest banks to take more money because they can turn around and extend credit. So you already said in your statement that you didn't feel that uh, public officials like you have any business telling banks how to lend because they're in a better position to do it, to, to make those determinations. And I don't know how you can say that with a straight face. After all, a lot of these banks uh, did some poor decision making. 
and got us into this mess. And so I'm just wondering, and I, and I know about that latitude that you talked about, but I'm wondering this new, the new program that you're talking about with regard to the auto loans and freeing up the money, how does that work? And how might that have effect on banks negatively or positively? Um, this, this program is a Federal Reserve, we call it a facility, where the Fed says they will lend money to people who buy securities. So new securities, a bunch of auto loans are packaged together, they meet certain standards, an investor wants to buy those securities, they can get a loan from the Federal Reserve to buy those securities. The investor has to put in some of their own money. Gotcha. And then they'll have that for up to three years. And so it enables private capital to come off the sidelines to get money into these markets with the federal government providing some of the lending to those investors. So mm -hmm. it, it's, it is complicated, but the market, the investors have said they really want it. And you know, the, the car companies and the student loan companies and the small business companies have all said this, is, this should really help them by bringing down rates for borrowers. At the end of the day, this program is all about bringing down rates for our consumers. And how does that affect the banks? Well, the banks in this case... What, what's your hope? The banks in this case are not... It's not the main priority of this program. This program is about getting lending to consumers. The banks have a role to play because they're the ones who buy all these auto loans, package them up, and then sell them to investors. So the banks have a role, but this is not about the banks extending credit. This is about getting credit going from the non-banking market to the to the consumers and to the car buyers. I got you. I got you. And so, so, but I was just wondering if, if this then establishes some kind of competition. In other words, these are people who are borrowing money from a non-bank. Correct. And so, I was just wondering how much competition that uh, gives to the banks, and whether that spares any. Activity. I, I think it's a good thing. I mean, I think you may, you you may the, respond, uh, and, and then uh, uh, the gentleman's time has expired. You, but Chairman. please respond. Thank you, Chairman. I think the more diverse sources we have of credit in our economy, the better we're going to be. And so we need to get the non-banking market going. Uh, we need the banks to do more, but we really need to get the non-banking market going. That's where the big hole is right now. And so we need all of it. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, we're going to go to round three. Uh, Mr. Kashkari, picking up where we left off, you said that Treasury's internal controls need apply only to Treasury and not to the banks that have sold equity to Treasury. Uh, now, yes, Congressman. I'm referring to the internal control provision in the I ESO. I understand, but I, I would uh, gently remind you that that view is somewhat extreme, that it's, it's at odds with legal analysis of your duties to monitor the use of TARP funds uh, by the banks that got them. Uh, C CRS has, uh, has spoken to this directly, and it's not alone. The GAO is also of the opinion that your legal duty is to monitor the use of TARP funds by the banks which receive them. It seems to me that you may be alone in the view that Congress didn't mean what it said in Section 116 of the EESA. We told you in there that we wanted Treasury to safeguard the TARP monies from waste and abuse. That is the meaning of the incorporation of the Federal Manager's Financial Integrity Act, Title 31, Section 3512C. And I think that you are taking a position that is not tenable and one that is pointedly lacking in uh, responsibility for the office that, that you hold. And uh, that is that you just say it's not your job. Now, uh, granted, you have come in under extraordinary circumstances, but we have a new administration coming in. And I'm hopeful they're going to take a fresh look at this law. And uh, if you want to comment on what I said, you'd feel free to, and then I've got some follow-up. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, we take protecting taxpayers' money extraordinarily seriously, extraordinarily seriously. What I was referring to is the, you know, the section you're referring to, the internal control provision of the ESA. I personally spoke with the GAO and the Special Inspector General about their interpretation of this, and they agreed with me. You'll hear from them on the third panel. They agreed with our assessment that this internal control provision is talking about Treasury's own internal controls within Treasury, 
and we've we're working we've made a lot of progress on our own internal controls. So you're controls. saying that that you you publicly acknowledge that you have a responsibility for the internal controls of the TARP funds once they go to the banks. No, no, I'm saying we have a responsibility for internal controls within the Treasury organization, and we have responsibilities to the taxpayers to make sure the money is used appropriately and in the best policy interests of the country. But the internal control provision is very narrowly focused. That doesn't mean we don't have to protect the taxpayers. We have other mechanisms for Are protecting the taxpayers. Are you saying Congress was not uh, specific enough in its uh, charge to, to you? Uh, I've been advised, and Congressman or Chairman, forgive me, I'm not an attorney. I've been advised by our lawyers at Treasury that Section 3512C of Title 31 United States Code is specifically about internal procedures within federal government agencies. And, and that's what we're referring to. That's what the law refers to right here on line 16. Uh, we're going to hear more about this point in the third panel. We don't think it's arcane. We think it relates directly to your responsibilities. When we began this day talking about how banks who got TARP funds are moving the money out of the country, uh, it's, it's my opinion, and apparently the opinion of some members of this panel, uh, that there should be accountability from the Treasury Department as to, as to U.S. taxpayers' funds being spent by TARP recipients in, in other countries, especially when we have such dire straits here. Now, in the time that I, that I have remaining on this uh, particular round, uh, I want to uh, talk about the, the impact of the uh, TARP funds. Uh, Congress has heard repeatedly the representations of large TARP recipients about the billions of dollars of new credit they're creating. They're eager to tell the side of the story, and you've repeated them today. You state on page 10 of your testimony that all loan amounts appear to be going up. But the lending is much reduced compared to the period before the crisis. Isn't that so? Yes, as I indicated. Oh, okay. okay, please. But then what about the other side of the picture? Are you collecting data from the banks on the contraction of existing credit that is occurring? Now, this goes to some of the questions Mr. Souders raised. Where have you shown the decline in credit due to foreclosures and a suspension of credit lines that our constituents are experiencing? How do those numbers compare to past periods? And, Mr. Kashkar, if the new credit doesn't more than offset the extinction of existing credit, does the economy experience a net positive effect from credit activities or a net negative effect? And do you have a, if you can respond to that, and my time has expired. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, there's no question that in recessions, credit levels fall because both lenders and borrowers are nervous about taking on new obligations and extending credit. There's no question about that. And when we look at the lending levels that we're seeing, we know that they're higher than they would have been absent the TARP funds. We think they've held up remarkably well in light of the severe economic contraction we had in Q4. But again, as I look at the, the broader credit problem, the banking sector is part of it. A much bigger problem at this point is the securitization market, the non-banking sector. So banking is not as high as we'd like it to be. Securitization is zero. And it was 40% before this started. So we need to get that going too. Yeah, I, my time's expired. I just want to comment that um, there is no time in the history of this country have we ever had a period where was, we're in a recession and there's massive amounts of federal dollars by the time this thing is through, maybe trillions of federal dollars going in to prop up the economy, and where's the money going in terms of a net new credit uh, to report to us? Uh, Mr. Souter. I want to uh, continue along this a, a little bit. Clearly because of Enron, we, we had to look at what I guess is called uh, uh, fair value measurements, which is mark to market. Um, and that uh, the, the challenge here that we have, because that went in in November 2007. So to talk about a change, it appears to be one of the changes that helped trigger the credit crisis, uh, with all due, due respect, because it exposed those who were not fair marketed value and then caused a panic beyond that, because it was a broad swipe at everybody's valuation, when in fact, in areas of the country like mine, we had been having 2 3% growth, not 100% growth in housing. Uh, the national went up 200% while the economy is growing about 3. It doesn't take a rocket scientist, it takes business 101 to see you've got a mismatch. But that mismatch was not universal. So we did a universal solution that in particular, and I'm fascinated because the more you read, the more you study about this, there's been a major changing in finances in the country, in securitization, and moving outside the Fed regulated and into this 40% other sector that you're talking about. 
Yet the banks are tightly regulated, and we slam fair market measurements on them. Now, if we fund the securitization group, getting to Mr. Cummings' question, are they going to have to play by the same rules as banks? And then, if they have to do fair market measurements, we're right back to, to where we were. There's got to be some kind of addressing an underlying concern. But let me first ask, in this trying to get the 40 percent securitization, are they going to come on? That was where the biggest problem were, was. Are they going to come, if they're going to compete on loans, are they going to come in under similar banking rules? <coughs> some of them are converting to banks. Correct. Uh, some, some uh, is this going to be a mandatory thing? Is there going to be a supervisory? This is where transparency starts to become a huge deal, because if the problem sector really, for the most part, it was not a bank, it was a division of a bank to compete with this 40 percent. Yeah, the 40 percent uh, part is made up of a lot of different type of institutions. So you've got, uh, you know, big banks like CIT, non-banks, excuse me, like CIT or GE Capital, et cetera. You have uh, pension plans, insurance companies who need to buy assets to match their liabilities. Um, you have various kind of funds all around the world. So there's, you can't, it's hard to define them as one category because there's all sorts of dogs and cats investing in the non-bank market and buying these securities. And most of them, to my understanding, are, in many cases, they are marking those securities to market. And so they do see the asset prices go up and down. So I think your points have a lot of merit. I would say the one other point in terms of accounting and transparency that's been at the root cause of this problem is it's been almost impossible to peer into these mortgage-backed securities to figure out which loans are in there, who wrote the loans, how are they doing. And because investors had a hard time peering into the mortgage-backed securities, let alone the CDOs when they were bundled together, they didn't know which mortgages were good, which securities were bad, so they pulled back from all of them. And that's, that's an example where, in, like in your district, no, where their no, home no, prices didn't take it, it off, they're take suffering. It doesn't take too much time. Uh, we've had multiple hearings here, reading about Countrywide and so on, that basically if you were paying 6%, there was less risk than if you were paying 14 When you start to see the high rates of return beyond the normal rates of return, the, you know, uh, the, the, I think it's Eric Paulson who made the 38 Seven billion. John uh, John Paulson. That John. Yeah. Uh, that um, when he was here, and I asked him a similar question, he said, "How do you think I made my money?" Uh, that that he could see this. Anybody who was studying it could figure out which ones were inflated and which ones weren't. It, it, it wasn't like that confused. It was sloppiness. People wanted the high returns. Uh, there, that you had to either be in pharmaceutical speculation, energy speculation, or housing speculation if you're getting higher than six or eight percent. And that that pension funds may have done that. I, I just. I'm not very tolerant of, of the, the people who say, oh, we couldn't figure out what was going on. We need more transparency, but they weren't paying close enough attention. But in, the, in this uh, non-bank financial uh, sector, in, in, in trying to, to monitor how, how they're doing, I have, I have Lincoln Financial in my district, the center of the annuities of the country. They bought a bank because they're now applying for TARP funds. Uh, and we saw a number of others convert to banks. But you suggested that the Federal Reserve is setting up a separate fund that won't require them to be like a bank. Correct. So the, 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 the new program that the Fed has set up, the Treasury supporting, to get lending going, it's many, many financial participants and who's can use it. going to regulate them and what guidelines are they going to have and are there going to be similar regulations? Because while we're all in Congress obsessed about the banking sector, you're telling us that there's a 40 percent and, and the Fed is floating out two trillion while we're dealing with $700 billion in your fund. So the Fed and Treasury designed very important pr procedures and restrictions to make sure we know the quality of the collateral that we're going to be getting. Because when the Fed loans in this new program, they're going to get the securities as collateral. So it's only going to be new loans, new securitizations in this, in this current program, and very strict guidelines in terms of what's eligible to make sure that we protect the taxpayers. There's not with it per se going to be new regulations that go for the people who are lending money into that system, but we're making sure the taxpayers are protected. Thank you. <coughs> Mr. Kennedy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <coughs> um, you've painted for us a very um, stark picture in terms of what we have in front of us, and that is we have the uncertainty of the markets um, and yet we have the necessity to act quickly. 
um, we're going to be confronted with the just choice as to how to put a, uh, an end to this uncertainty by uh, putting up however many more uh, billions of dollars to, to stave off continued um, decline in, in the markets and continued um, um, uh, recession that's going to lead to, to further dislocation of our workers in this country. And the President's spoken very clearly of the need to act now or act later. Um, the question I have for you is, um, given the fungibility that you say, you know, these financial institutions are, are, are involved with, the, with respect to the m world markets, how can we be certain that the dollars that are going to be going into this public-private fund um, are dollars that are going to absolutely mean the end of the uncertainty with respect to those toxic assets when we're part of an international world economy now and, and we want to make sure that whatever final package is the final package and that there isn't going to be another shoe to drop, so to speak. I mean, that's what my constituents want to know. We want closure just as much as the President does. We want to be able to move on. We don't want this recession to drag on any further. And we also don't want to overpay for these toxic assets any more than uh, they, they have to be. But we understand that um, if we let this recession drag on, it's going to cost us a great deal. And I'd ask you to comment on this because I think this is a fundamental point that most economists have been talking about is you know, what is it that we have to put the staunch to, uh, wrap the tourniquet around, and, and uh, how do we wrap a tourniquet around something that is involved in a global uh, economy in terms of assets? Uh, thank you, Congressman. I'm going to, I'll answer your question in two parts. First part, the global nature. Uh, we cannot act alone. So we have our programs. We are consulting closely with our counterparties in other countries who are taking similar measures that are tailor-made for their system. The world leading economies all need to act. And I think that they are acting with different speeds, but they are acting and we're going to continue to have an active dialogue to encourage all of us to move in a coordinated fashion, number one. Number two, Secretary Geithner's financial stability plan has laid out a broad framework to do this. There's not one piece of it that by itself will solve everything. We have the capital program that he's laid out to make sure our banks have enough capital, even in a worse economic environment, that they can continue to lend. That's very important. That is underway. The details are out there. Number two is the lending program that we talked about, scaling up from $200 billion to a trillion dollars to make sure our consumers and our small businesses can get the credit that they need right now. That's underway. It's going to start funding in a couple weeks. And then third is the public-private partnership that we just talked about to go after the bad assets. Not one of these tools by itself will be the final, the final solution. We believe these three tools, combined with the other tools that the Fed and other regulators have done, will get at this. Fundamentally, we have a credit crisis that has hurt our economy. And now the economy is, is looping back. It's a vicious cycle, and it's hurting the financial system again. And so we have to go at it from the financial perspective, and then the stimulus bill that the Congress passed and the President signed is also going to be very important to getting the economy going. We need to go at it from both directions. I would say that, um, obviously, as we've heard this morning, transparency. We need to be able to show the American public uh, just how this links to them. And, and I understand the college loans, I understand the making payroll in businesses, I understand people's vested pensions and annuities. But you know, we need to make that even clearer to people because right now uh, that, that case has not been fully made. And until it's fully made, uh, we're not going to be able to come back to the American people and say to them, this is in your interest because right now they don't see it as in their interest. And, uh, and, and there's only one person who can really make that argument. That's the President of the United States. You can't have 535 members of Congress out there trying to explain to the American people how 
getting this financial system back on track by infusing it with more dollars is going to do this for them when all they're seeing is that, you know, kind of trickle down. They've got to understand that this is a part of the lifeblood of the economy uh, and the lifeblood of our financial system is, the, is one and the same. Um, right now, th that's not becoming very transparent, as you've seen from this hearing. And until that becomes transparent, uh, it's going to be very hard for our, the people's representatives, us, to be able to, to give the president what he needs in order to infuse uh, any more assets into this, uh, uh, into this uh, kind of recovery. So we certainly want this, this, uh, to get out of this situation, but we need the really clear you know, leadership and uh, explanation from the top and the, only the way the president can deliver it. Thank you. General, uh, gentleman's time has expired. Um, Mr. Issa. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Kashkari, you've been as good as your word. It's, uh, it's been quite an afternoon, and I appreciate your time. Uh, one question I have for you. Earlier I asked about, <clears throat> if you will, pushback or influence or advocacy by members of Congress. But now let's switch to the other side. Tell me about the pushback you inherently get or you're getting or resistance you're getting from the mortgage industry, from the banking industry on giving you the facts and figures you might need in order to better analyze the underlying assets that we so often call toxic? So far, uh, con Congressman, every time we've asked for data from any recipient banks, they've all complied with us because they know they need to. It's in the country's interest and their interest to comply. Uh, and that's really focused on lending levels, which many people ask us about. And as I said, we're going out to all the institutions uh, to collect the data, not just the top 20. We have not gone out and done a survey of so-called toxic assets per se. I think if we asked them for the data, they would provide it to us. We have, again, we work closely with the regulators who have a lot of this data already. I know that the OCC, the OTS, and the FDIC, for example, collect loan level data from all of their banks and roll that up to look at what's happening in mortgages around the country. So uh, we get the data from different places, partly from the banks, partly from the regulators. As yet, we haven't had any pushback uh, to the data that we've asked for. Okay. Uh, earlier today, uh, there was some talk about loans going to Dubai and China and other places. Isn't it true that the United States is a net debtor around the world? Yes. So if we wanted back all the money that, if you will, we've loaned and invested in other places, and the rest of the world did the same in return. Wouldn't we suddenly have trillions of dollars of shortfall far beyond what we're putting in with TARP? I believe so, yes. Okay. I just, I, I had that impression, a little CNBC and Fox Business News, it seemed that it was that way. Uh, <clears throat> uh, I'm sorry, uh, Congressman Kennedy has left, but he talked about certainty, one time, et cetera. From your standpoint, having lived with multiple tranches of different solutions, TARP being one of them. Do you think we're well served by having one more, this is it, it encompasses everything, will never come to come back? Or should we look at smaller uh, steps with more congressional oversight? In other words, do what you think is right, come back to us and tell us what you've done, uh, rather than the $700 billion, which, as by your own admission, really never got used in the original way and will be probably gone before we begin buying those assets in any great numbers. So I, I don't want to say that he was wrong, but wouldn't you say the opposite is true, that, that we should ask for careful and deliberate actions, even if they're not complete, agree to those, authorize you, and then have you come back when you learn more? I think that there's merit in that, I, but I'm... I'm cautious because sometimes we have to take action that is so unpleasant, but it's so urgent. We just have to move. Sure. And, and, so and I'm not suggesting little teeny sizes, but uh, the $700 billion, which was 350 350 represented, uh, by your own statement, at least 489 different transactions. So going forward, you don't need a trillion all at once next time uh, that, in fact, although we may authorize and anticipate a trillion, the, the, the periodic reporting that we could expect in a TARP 2, uh, the updates and the increments could, in fact, be more manageable because we're not dealing with an overnight crisis in which you don't know how much you need to put out, but you might need to put it all out in one day, so to speak. I think it could be, and I think that this is consistent with the way Secretary Geithner is thinking about it because his new programs, we can get going 
with the available capital we have, we can assess that they're having the desired effect and then come back and ask, if, if and when he decides to ask for more, do so then. Now I've got a kind of a, a long arm question for you and it's, it, it's a big one and it's a little outside yours. So if you feel uncomfortable completely answering it today, I hope you'd come back with your thoughts. Up until now, members of Congress have been saying we've got to put, and, and the administration, two administrations, have been saying we have to put money in in order to free up mortgages. And I'm not dis dissuading anyone today from that view. But another scenario, if we hadn't put a penny in to the back end, the banks, and instead we put a hypothetically sufficient amount, whatever it was, into the refinancing of new mortgages, so that if a bank said, look, I'm, I'm calling the loan, Here's the foreclosure, because as you know, they're, they're not doing foreclosures right now in many cases. They're, people are staying in their homes months and months and months waiting to see what happens. If they'd done all the foreclosures and people who could make a monthly payment on a future mortgage had available mortgages, if we facilitated the front end of the new mortgage with trillions of dollars of, of capability, wouldn't we in some ways have marked to market, refinanced, found the good people, renegotiated in much less time than now where we're putting money in. The chairman and others have made the point that it doesn't necessarily seem to be trickling down. We're pushing it on this end, asking it to end up here, rather than saying, do what you think is right and we'll take care of people who are credit worthy, whether they are existing homeowners or future homeowners on those foreclosed properties. The gentleman's time's expired, but I would ask uh, if you would answer his question. Uh, thank you. I, I think uh, Congressman, I think we're doing both. So I think the actions taken to stabilize Fannie and Freddie to make sure that mortgages were still available and FHA is very important. I don't think we could just say, forget the banks, we're just going to start up all new lending programs because we'd have no way of administering that. You know, the, the banks, for, for all our, our frustrations, they have thousands of branch offices in all of our communities and they are the tentacles out in to get credit out there. So I think we need to do both providing the government support for the lending, like the new program that I talked about, uh, as well as helping the banks get through this time. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. I, I thank the gentleman. You know, one of the, uh, we're going to go to a fourth uh, round with Mr. Kashgari. Uh, one of the things that I'm concerned about, uh, it, the Washington Post reports on a public-private partnership. They say the, uh, uh, last week the government is seeking to resuscitate the nation's crippled financial system by forging an alliance with the very outfits that most benefited from the bonanza preceding the collapse of the credit markets, hedge funds and private equity firms. Uh, the article goes on to say that they'd be invited to buy up recently issued highly rated securities. These securities finance consumer lending such as credit cards and student and auto loans. The program would involve the government lending nearly one trillion dollars. Is this a public-private partnership you're talking about? Yes. Okay. So. Uh, in, in this uh, graph that the, uh, in, in some artwork that the Post puts out, they say that um, uh, with government assistance to stimulate purchases of the securities investors borrow from the Fed for $10 million worth, an investor might put up $1 million and borrow $9. And then it says the second part, the public part, the government offers to cover losses if consumers default and the asset-backed security declines in value. And it goes on to say that if the asset-backed security value falls, um, an investor may lose only his original $1 million, and the uh, Treasury and the Fed would absorb additional losses, which means that the exposure under this, according to this report, the exposure of uh, uh, the Treasury and the Fed could be as much as 90%. Um, now, here's my, here's my question. The Obama budget says that uh, he's put, he's put a, um, a marker, placeholder, of $250 billion, anticipating that would be the losses uh, if, uh, if the government goes forward with a $750 billion TARP II. Uh, we see uh, that uh, there's a, a discussion among uh, more money going to the FDIC. We know that the, that the amount of losses according to the President's new budget, is 33 percent estimate. We know that the amount of loss that you had before is around 30 percent. That's what the number that's being thrown, thrown about. Is it possible that if we go forward with a total of what could be about $3 trillion in TARP funds, rough figure, 
if the estimated loss would be 30 to 33 percent, we're looking at taxpayers being stuck with 900 to billion to a trillion dollars. Now, think about this. Every, you know, if you if you'd use three trillion dollars, and you have uh, somebody else could do the math here, but you have 300 million Americans. Is is that like ten thousand dollars per capita? Is that like thirty thousand dollars or more a family that we're into this already? And then you get to this. Check this out. Today's headline: Washington Post. Rays of hope for big banks spur rally on Wall Street. Citigroup uh, apparently is doing some uh, recovery. Uh, and the article says, and this, is, this goes to what Mr. Kennedy raised and what I want to I laser focus on right now. Investors were being dealt more signs yesterday that corporations were shedding more jobs, seen by many as a way for companies to steady themselves during a deepening recession. United Technologies, a large industrial company, said it expects to lay off 11,600 employees. AOL said it's executing a second major round of layoffs, shedding 10 percent of its workforce. I'm from Cleveland. Our economy's been falling apart. We've got foreclosures everywhere. The subprime loan bandits have capitalized in my city and crushed neighborhoods in my city. We're, our steel mill's in trouble. We have auto plants that are in trouble. And, and the banks are, doing, are, are starting to come back, according to this. But we don't see any evidence that we're going to come back. What, what can you tell the people in neighborhoods across this country that they should go ahead and put trillions of dollars of their money at risk when we're reading these reports that, they could, that it looks like huge losses are in the offing under the best of circumstances? Why aren't we taking a controlling interest in mortgage-backed securities and the government directing loan modifications instead of, to, to lower principal, lower interest, instead of leaving it up to uh, people who are still freezing credit here in the States while they're shipping uh, jobs and money overseas. This, to me, is a textbook definition of, of political insanity. And I would just like, you know, do you ever think about these things, about the, the, the inherent contradictions that are in this, about how, you know, Wall Street might have one view of the world, but, uh, but the rest of America's uh, uh, just beset with all these problems as a result of Wall Street? Thank you, Chairman. I think about these things all the time. And let me, you asked a, a very important but complex question, so please permit me to give a thorough answer to your question. First, let's talk about the foreclosure piece. You know, the administration has now come out with what I think is a very good loan modification program, a $75 billion program to encourage servicers and lenders to make long-term sustainable loan modifications. That program is getting up and running right now. We have teams of people reporting to me, that are working on implementing that right now. We feel very good about that. I think that's going to make a, an important difference in our com communities, number one. Number two, in terms of the loss estimates, I, I would like to offer uh, my perspective on that. I think we have to segment our different programs because different programs have different classes of risk for the taxpayers. So, for example, the lending initiative that I've spent a lot of time talking about today, which Secretary Geithner wants to take to a trillion dollars, is secured by very high quality collateral. We expect, where, where investors are in the first loss, actually there are multiple losses for investors, before Treasury's exposed or the taxpayer is exposed. My expectation is the losses on that, on that pro program or the risks on that program are much, much lower than the risks and some of the other things that we've had to do. So I don't think it's, I'm just telling you candidly, I don't think we can take the loss estimate for one program and uh, scale it up and apply it. I don't think it's gonna be uh, that, uh, that aggressive. Nonetheless, there are real risks. You know, we're all taxpayers, and none of us like putting our dollars at risk to have to do what we're having to do. But the economic consequences for all of us are much, much greater if we don't do these distasteful things that we're having to do, these putting taxpayer dollars at risk, intervening in these markets. We're having to do this. Uh, it's, un it's in our own interest. We need to get through this crisis as quickly as possible so the economy can grow again, so we can create jobs. And then we need to reform our regulatory system so we don't get back here again. Uh, my time's expired. I'd like to go to Mr. Souter. I, I, I thank you for your time today, and I wanted to leave you with a couple thoughts. One encouraging thing is all these hearings, which I know have to be frustrated to you, 
It's amazing how much about finance Americans are going to be learning in this process. Uh, what risks are, it's like we forgot what risk was. Uh, that in my house, I bought it from a, a local uh, small town bank, Grable Bank. Uh, next thing I knew, I was sending it to Brussels, uh, to Amro Ambro or whatever that company is. Now it goes to a company owned by the Chinese. Uh, if we're not careful here, we'll slam down our own mortgages on our, ourselves. This is this money is all over the place and split and securitized and uh, much more complicated than most of us uh, even think about uh, when we get our uh, home mortgage, which may not even have the name of the company we're paying to. Right. Uh, that um, uh, the transparency question. One is, I know that some banks are nervous about getting in because they're worried that if they get this fund, they're going to uh, get a call from you or somebody that says, we noticed you put satellite radio in your car. Why did you do that? Uh, they're very concerned about the big hand of, of government here because they're watching the micromanaging. What's a fair salary? How do you do this? And what, on the other hand, from the taxpayer perspective, you can hear today a lot of the frustration with transparency. And uh, I think uh, while you need to have your um, uh, private ability, and I'm very worried we're about in the process of potentially destroying private sector capital because of the amount of money that the government's going to be taking, how we're going to ma micromanage this, the different loan uh, categories. It's, it's a frightening thing. There might be public-private partnerships, but it's a scary time if you're a, more of a private sector person, partly brought on by the par private sector. But in the transparency question, um, I understand the point here, but even in mark-to-market, -mark there's a deep suspicion that, that because the change only occurred in 07, that the reason we can't come back is, is that hedge fund, people who are buying short and long and all this kind of stuff have a chokehold on the system and it's not transparent. And that what would seem logical to a traditional banking system, we can't see what's happening. And that leads to a mistrust because it seems to a hardworking person who gets up in the morning and goes to work and starts a small business and tries to get expansion loan and then the bank calls down and says, we're not going to keep your revolving loan credit there. We're having struggles. Partly is somebody speculating against me and I can't see it. And so one of the advantages of the education process that we're going through is, is that it's also generated a fear that some people are manipulating us. And I think that the demand of transparency is going to overwhelm the desire to be uh, have flexibility in your decisions. Uh, when you touch the government, you get the full scale of the government. And this is very worrisome to many of us. At the same time, I don't know how to do it because even I don't have a lot of trust right now. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Gentlemen, uh, Mr. Cummings. Yeah, I, was, I was just sitting here thinking about what um, somebody watching this, whether the American people would, uh, how would they feel about all of this? The, this hearing, the newspapers are running story, by the way, just in case your staff hadn't told you, Cash Carry says that we should stay out of the bank's business of lending. That's, that's the story that's come out of this. That's what's all over the place. And uh, then you've got AI Reuters it just came out with a story an hour ago. I just want to quote from this story. Uh, it says, six months after the United States government stepped in, stepped in and sa saved an insurance giant overwhelmed by derivative losses, AIG continues to bleed red ink. Its stocks and bondholders have been crushed, but one group has suffered almost no damage banks that bought credit protection from AIG financial products. Regulatory filings show that since the Federal Reserve announced its rescue of AIG on September 15th, about $50 billion of government money has passed through the company to the banks. Treasury is providing a, quote, Treasury is providing a massive wealth transfer from taxpayers to Goldman Sachs and other parties, and it's something that absolutely should be investigated, said Eric Hovey, Hovey, chief executive of Hovey Capital Advisors, where he manages financial services focused on hedge funds. Um, and I think 
the reason why I mention that is it seems like the 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 banks are coming out of this pretty good. They're getting money, whether they want it or not. They get it. If they don't like your rules, you know what they say? Screw you. We'll give it back. Then we've got you saying we shouldn't meddle in their business. Taxpayers are saying we just want to go alone. Then you tell us that you, and, and, and I'm, I'm sure this is, is, important, is, is a good thing, this uh, entity that you're creating to help people get loans and auto loans and, and all of that. But the problem is this. It seems as if we're going, it's, 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 I mean, it seems that we are helping the banks tremendously, but they basically, I mean, and they could be more of a part of the solution to the problem, but I kind of think, maybe whether it's intentional or un unintentional, that we just said to them, you go guys, we're going to keep on giving you the money and you do whatever you want. Because the top guy says, Congress, don't, don't, we, we shouldn't be trying to determine who they lend to. They are the decision makers. As President Bush said, the deciders. And the deciders have gotten us into the jam that we're in today. And I guess what I'm trying to say is that I want to go back to that analogy that I gave. You, I, I believe that you all are doing everything in your power. I believe that you lose sleep. I think you're giving it everything, and I think you're very, very competent. I think the whole team is. But I feel like you're going up a hill, but, but, but it's not becoming any easier when, when, the, Bush, the, the, when the, the banks could help us up this hill by having some gravel down there so we could get something so that we could get a, a grip on or something. We get ice. And I don't know whether it's, I, I, sometimes I, I think that the folks on Wall Street operate on a, in a whole different world. I don't know if they even have a clue, a clue about the people who are looking at this right now. I really don't. It's like, you know, when, I, when they say a million dollars, it's like $25 to the folks who are losing their homes. And so I got to, I gotta, you got to say something to me. You got to do something for me to tell these banks to, to, to help out. I mean, I don't, want, I don't want this hearing, I don't want us to leave this hearing with them saying, thanks, now we've really got our way. And, it, and it's very, very painful. Uh, you may uh, respond to Mr. Cummings, uh, and then we'll, we'll conclude this round. Uh, thank you, uh, Congressman. I share your frustration. Every time I open the paper and I read another story of some shindig somewhere, I just wonder, what are these guys thinking? They're not helping themselves. They're not helping me. They're not helping the Washington or the people, you know, our leaders who are trying to get us through this. They're not helping the American people have confidence. And so I think that there have been many cases of enormous lapses of judgment in some of the actions that the banks have taken. And I also, sir, I don't want to leave you with the wrong impression. My comments about we don't want to micromanage these institutions, I'm talking about the hundreds, maybe thousands of institutions we're investing in, community banks all around our country who did not create this problem. But we want to encourage them to participate because they're in the best position to step up and increase credit. So that's where my, my comments were directed there. For the institutions, the one-offs, that made terrible decisions, and they need extraordinary assistance from the federal government to prevent them from being destabilized, then we absolutely have obligations and responsibilities to make sure that they run their businesses in a prudent and sound manner and that they can pay back the taxpayers. Again, my two highest priorities are financial stability and paying back the taxpayers. Thank you. I, I thank the gentleman. Um, Mr. Cash, Gary, you've uh, been here for four rounds of questioning. Uh, we're going to conclude uh, uh, the questioning of, of you and uh, thank you for giving this committee your time here and giving uh, 
this country, your service. Uh, we know this hasn't been easy for you as a witness, uh, but I think that you've been a good witness in representing uh, the point of view that Treasury has been conducting as policy. The uh, difference that we have is, you know, that we have to, this whole hearing has been about challenging the policies about uh, what we believe is Treasury's failure to monitor the ways in which financial institutions are using taxpayers' funds. And, and I think that, you know, as I uh, conclude and, uh, you know, send you with, with the uh, appreciation of this committee, I, I, one of the things I've seen here, and Mr. Souter uh, brings it up, uh, you know, there, there is a fundamental flaw in government intervention in the markets. I mean, this is, uh, we're, this is why we're here. Uh, the um, um, government's intervening in markets, and it's picking winners and losers. Um, so when the issue came up about micromanaging, uh, you have to remember that Congress has a constitutional obligation for oversight. We're a co-equal branch of government, and uh, we cannot defer to, to Treasury when, when there are trillions of tax dollars at stake. I know, I know you understand that, which is the whole point of this hearing, and that uh, the reason why we're here in the first place is that uh, the banks did not perform their fiduciary responsibilities. So when we want to defer to the banks again, you could understand why we'd have some problems with just letting that go unchallenged and in uh, not insisting that Treasury, as we move forward, has to look at their responsibilities for monitoring the ways in which financial institutions are, are, um, are using these tax fair funds under the Troubled Asset Relief Program. So with that, I just want to say that you've appeared before this subcommittee on two occasions. Uh, you have conducted yourself in a way that I, th I think reflects honor uh, and service to the country, and I want to thank you for your presence here and all, all the members of this committee who I've talked to uh, about your presence here today. While we may take issue with your presentation, uh, we think that you have certainly been an excellent witness for the Department of Treasury. So thank you, Mr. Kashkari. Uh, we are going to uh, proceed. Uh, the first panel is now, uh, with Mr. Kashkari, is now discharged. And uh, we're going to take a five-minute recess, and it's only five minutes, as we get the second panel together. And we're going to combine the second panel and the third panel together without objection. But we're going to take a five-minute recess. Uh, we'll be back in five minutes. <laughs>